today we'll discuss what are the various tools that are used in devops okay so they are all uh, new names for you i mean uh, like the devops la landscape has various tools like one is for code and commit code and commit means for the developers who write the code and then commit it into a repository okay so these are various kinds of tools available one of them is git one of them is SVN, TFS, Perforce. These are various tools. You will learn about them one by one. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, why they are used and when they are used, I'll tell everything. But this is just the story, like uh, what all tools you will be using. Okay. So for uh, code and commit, you will be using any of this. Not all. Any you can choose. Nowadays, most people use Git. Prior to that, people were using SVN. Uh, in Microsoft, uh, people use TFS, so things like that. And then uh, we we have certain tools called build and config tools, uh, which automate the most of the things in DevOps are automated. That is one of the ideologies of DevOps. Like whatever we are doing, uh, we will do it automatically, not manually. Okay, so that is uh, that is how we automate using uh, these tools: Chef, Puppet. Docker and Maven. Okay, these are not any technologies or anything. These are just names of those tools. When you start using it, you will understand what those tools do or what they are. They are just softwares. Like, like you use MS Excel to do spreadsheets. You use MS Word to write uh, documents. Like that. These are various tools to do certain things. Like for writing code and committing it into a repository. You use for automating certain build process, you use Chef, Puppet, all these tools, okay. And then uh, for testing is also automated. Like tester will manually not test. He will write some rules. Like he will tell that uh, you go there, click this button. This should come as the normal outcome. If that doesn't come, then the test has failed. Like that he will write a test case and then execute it. That will be executed automatically. So for testing and scanning, these are the various tools, Sonar, JUnit, Jarrett, Selenium, like that, okay. And similarly, for versioning, like I said, for uh, every software release, we give it a version 1.0, 2.0, like that. So that version number and everything is also done man uh, automatically. That is uh, managed by these softwares, Serena, CollabNet, Release, UDeploy. So these are the names of the tools. Similarly, after the software is ready, the software is deployed on a certain platform in order to test that everything runs fine. So for that, we use virtual environments or cloud environment. So for virtual environment, we use tools like VMware, uh, Azure, AWS, Docker. Okay, so these are also names of uh, virtualization softwares. So these are the various categories of tools which we use in the DevOps landscape, okay. So next we move on. Uh, so version control system tools, like in the previous slide here I was telling for code and commit we are using these kind of tools, Git, SVN and all. So that is the version control system. Like as I said, there are five developers who write code. Then when they write the code, they will commit it into a, a certain software, okay. So uh, that that is called the uh, version control software or version control system. So there are various kinds of version control system softwares. So you can use SVN, Git, or TFS. These are three main primarily used, but most popular one now is Git. Okay. Okay. So version control system. These are the various tools. And then for code quality and testing, uh, these are tools, Sonar and IntelliJ. Sonar is open source. So Sonar is one of the open source softwares which is used for testing. Similarly, uh, Maven is one software which automates builds. Like in Java, uh, after writing code, you have to compile the code. So that is done by writing some commands. Like there are some build commands which you have to type in and then the code will be built into an executable file. So in order to automate that, nowadays people don't write those commands. They have this Maven tool. And Maven tool is having a configuration file where you tell what to do. And you write it once and then automatically the build happens. Okay. Maven used for build automation. 
after the software is written for building it we use this tool similarly there is a framework called jenkins jenkins what it does it enables ci and cd continuous integration and continuous delivery are one of the uh, main goals of uh, devops so here what we do after the de developer writes the code many of the developers are writing code for the same project so once they commit it so all their codes are integrated in one version control system using any of these tools and that is called continuous integration and after the integration it goes for testing uh, and that is also automated and then after the testing it goes for delivery that means it is deployed to some server so in order to automate the entire pipeline this entire process is called a pipeline okay so uh, to make the delivery from right from the developer end to the delivery end so that thing uh, is managed by these softwares like jenkins team city bamboo and uh, also tfs to some extent but mainly jenkins is uh, nowadays used in most of the companies they use jenkins or bamboo bamboo is a paid product it is uh, chargeable it is uh, built by a company called atlassian and jenkins is open source okay so jenkins it will uh, allow you to do the continuous integration and delivery automatically so once you see that tool you will understand exactly what is just now you just remember that it is a automation tool that allows you to build and uh, deliver everything and test also automatically and uh, so you remember this jenkins and bamboo these are most common team city is microsoft product paid product so less people buy buy it and uh, tfs also uh, but most of the companies use either bamboo or jenkins Jenkins was earlier developed by a company called Sun Microsystems. You might have heard about Sun Solaris. So Jenkins later on when Sun was sold to Oracle, so uh, Sun was marketing the software as a, uh, called a Hudson. So after uh, Oracle brought that uh, company, then what happened? Uh, Jenkins became an open source. It is the fork of that Hudson software and uh, now it is open source and the configuration management like uh, sometimes we have to automate the configuration or a task so scripts what are they used to automate certain small things say you want to take a backup of your server at night and you cannot get uh, i mean you want to copy and everything in the c drive and keep it somewhere so you cannot every day go and manually copy so you write a script which will do the automation and you can run it uh, as in the scheduled tasks so the, that will automatically run the script similarly while deploying a server like say we want to make a web server so we want to take a linux system then we go and install apache in it so a web server is uh, made to work so in this case what we do we have to manually write commands and do everything but in DevOps scenario, since we want to automate everything and uh, save our time, what we do, we use these tools, Ceph, Puppet, Ansible, in order to make this uh, entire configuration management automatic. And then uh, next, uh, here we have uh, another software uh, for monitoring. Once the server is running, we have to more. We cannot be continuously be able to check whether the server is up or not. So there are certain tools to monitor the software round the clock and then you can see the graphs and uh, check whether the server is up or down or uh, what is the availability status and how the server is doing like in terms of how much RAM is used, how much CPU is being used at particular time. So everything can be monitored by using the software Nagios and Zabbix. There are a lot other softwares also which we will try out. So one of the main ones are Zabbix and Nagios, okay. And then uh, we have certain softwares for log analysis. Like you might have seen uh, when a program is running, there are certain logs which are created in a server. And using those logs, you can debug. If there is any problem, then you can uh, sort out. You can check the logs and see whether there is any error message or not. And if there is an error, you can act accordingly. So in order to analyze those logs there are certain softwares okay so those are the log stash elastic search 
let's discuss what a DNS is. DNS stands for Domain Name Service. What exactly it does is uh, like uh, when we say you want to open a website, so the website uh, actually resides on a server and that server has an IP address. Every server which is on the network or on the internet has an IP address. So if you put the IP address then you can on the browser then you and, the, and if the server has Apache or Nginx or any web server software installed in it you can see uh, a web page on that server okay so uh, but remembering the IP address of each server is very difficult you cannot remember which IP address google.com resides on you cannot remember what IP address Facebook is residing on so in order to make things simpler for us uh, what happens there is a service or a protocol called DNS okay it runs on TCP IP so what DNS does is it resolves uh, your uh, name to IP and vice versa okay so that is called a forward lookup when we do a resolution from name to IP so when we write www.google.com then in the back end the DNS server returns the IP address for the query and contacts you to the uh, that particular server which has the website or any other resource so that makes things simple uh, for us to uh, contact the server now this is just for your knowledge I mean how things happen and temporarily for name resolution you can use host spy uh, which which is present in every Linux and Windows server Okay, I'll show you the location where uh, where it resides, and uh, over, what is happening is only the name resolution part is taken care of uh, by the DNS server. Now let me get into a more detail how it happens. Like say you are writing a website name on your browser from your laptop. You write a website name www anything say intellipad.com or xyz.com whatever now your laptop does not know the IP address where the website actually resides so uh, what happens uh, your uh, laptop uh, has a DNS server set in its uh, network settings okay like I can show you here if I go here or in, in a Windows machine also you can see uh, since I am connected to Wi-Fi and uh, if I go here in the DNS you can see I have two DNS servers set here okay so uh, these are the servers which my laptop will connect to in order to query for uh, the setting I mean uh, the DNS uh, resolution okay and now uh, how does this all work it first of all it goes to the internet service provider or a local DNS server if it is present in your own office a local DNS server then first it goes there and if it gets the answer of the query from that DNS server then fine the DNS server returns the query and you can open the website but if this server does not have the record it is not possible for every server to have every record uh, of every name uh, in the internet so sometimes they actually uh, have a limited set of data uh, which they cache uh, in the local service so if if it is a common website which someone else has opened then the uh, entry might be present in the cache and you can open it otherwise what happens the local server then sends uh, the request to the authoritative DNS server. This is another server. There are the hierarchy of DNS servers. Okay, so we don't have to worry about these servers. Uh, the internet service provider has uh, access to these servers and updates its local server accordingly. So it goes to the authoritative server. If it returns the result, then fine. Otherwise, it goes to another server called the top-level DNS server. And if it is there, then fine. Otherwise, it goes to root DNS server. So this is just the hierarchy how the DNS name resolution occurs. Only thing you have to remember is what is DNS and what does it do. And uh, in order to create a temporary DNS in a 
say in a Linux server or a Windows server, you can edit the host file and uh, you can do it that way. Okay, I'll show you one example. Now here, I have one server one, this is CentOS 7 and server 2. These two are uh, currently running. So let's log into the server. Okay, one more thing. When you have VirtualBox servers running here, you can either log in directly using this ter terminal. Thanks. Okay. Uh, which uh, VirtualBox provides. Or you can use a third party terminal. Uh, if you are on Windows, you can use a terminal called Putty. P U T T Y. Yes, you can download it from here. Okay. So this is a terminal for Windows. I mean, here you put the IP address. Uh, once it opens, this window will open up. And then you can put the IP address and uh, then connect to the server. Otherwise, if you find it difficult, you can directly go here and even work. But I also connect using a terminal. Why? Because uh, it makes things convenient. Sometimes you want to copy paste some commands or uh, something from your laptop, then it makes it more convenient using this terminal. Now, since this is a Mac system, it already has a iTerm terminal inbuilt. But if you are using a Windows system, you will have to download that Putty software. Okay. Now, after uh, going into the iTerm or any terminal, the Putty terminal, if you want to connect, you have to use this command SSH. Okay. This is a command to connect to a remote system. Now, this this is not mandatory. You can directly do these steps from here. But I am showing you this because later on even when you go to certain companies the server would be actually in a server room. It won't be outside. So it is not possible to always go physically into the server room and log into the server. So in such cases if you have this terminal software with you, you can use this command to remotely log in. Only thing you have to know is the IP address. Okay. So what we do, we have the this server, let's check the IP address of the server. The command for checking IP address is IP space A. So here we get the IP address of the server. It shows that the IP address is 192.168.1.104. So before logging in, let's ping the server. Yes, it is available. If you ping and see there is a reply from the server, you know that you are connected uh, properly to the server, so you can log into the server. If the ping does not reply, say, uh, I will ping some random IP address like 105, which is not present. You see there is a request timeout. So that means this server IP is not available. Now we are logging into this server. So what we do is, this is the username, the admin username. This is the IP address of the server. Now it's prompting me for the password. So I have set the password of IntelliPad. So you, you can see now I can log in into the system. Now if I check the IP address, see I am inside the system which is having an IP address of 104. Okay. Now, what I wanted to show you is, from here, we can ping the other, from inside this server, we can ping the other box. Let's check what is the IP address of the other box. Yeah, the IP address of the other box is 192.168.1.101. Let's see from this box whether we can ping the other box or not. Dot one zero one. Yes, we can ping it. So what does this mean? That one zero four server is able to get one zero one server in the network. Okay. So this part is fine. But now 
say you don't want to remember the name of that other server. I don't want to remember the, uh, sorry, the IP address of the other server and I want to ping it. Say this one is server 1, my server is server 1 and the other server is, uh, the second server is server 2 and I want to ping it using the name server 2. So what I can do is, I can make a DNS entry for name resolution. How to do that? You have to go to the host's file. Where is that file? That file is in the etc directory. Okay. Before doing anything, let me give a brief overview of uh, certain Linux uh, basics. In Linux, if you do cd command, you can change directory. And slash is the root of the file system. So when I go to cd slash, I can see all other file systems which are present. Now, how to see that? I have to give a command ls. L. So that lists all the directories. Okay. So that means a Linux file system has the slash directory as the root and inside it there are various directories, just folders like bin, boot, dev, etc. These are different folders and each folder in Linux has, uh, has certain uh, functionality. I mean uh, it stores uh, certain uh, fixed kind of data like etc directory would store all the configuration related information. Like say you install Apache web server and you want to set uh, have some settings of the web servers to be stored. So that will be stored in etc. Like uh, this boot directory it will store uh, all the uh, bootloader information. Like during boot what screen to show what operating system to boot by default, what other options can be given if there is a dual booting and all these kind of things. Similarly, bin folder will store all the commands. It's similar to Windows also. In Windows you might have seen in C drive there is a program files which stores all the program uh, files or installed programs related thing. And there, uh, there are other folders like documents and settings which will store uh, the home directory of every user. So similarly in Linux also, we have various directories which have functionality. You can read up on it uh, and as we encounter certain folders, I'll tell you more on that. So now we are concerned with etc. So inside etc folder, as I said, we have all the configuration and system settings. So now we want to make a DNS uh, address entry. So we, we have to make it in the etc directory. Okay. So in order to edit a file in Linux, there is a command called vi. Okay. And if you are not comfortable uh, much with command line, you can also install the Linux graphical mode and try that. But it's, uh, it's recommended you go through how to use the vi editor. Okay. This editor which will be used to edit the file is called vi. You can check about that okay, in the internet and even try this editor. It comes by default installed uh, in the Linux distribution. So now vi and uh, we are going to the folder path where we can make the changes to the DNS name. Okay. So etc hosts. This is the file name etc hosts. I go into that folder. So inside it, we can make entries in this format, IP address and the name. So what I want to do, I want to ping the second system using its name, not the IP address. So I put the IP address and name mapping here, 168, 1 dot, uh, so what was the IP address of the other system, let's check again. It was 101, okay. And the system name, say we want to put the name as server 2. Okay. So now, if I ping server 2, I can ping the server. Okay. That means it's reachable. And since we have put the IP address uh, name mapping, uh, then we are being able to ping using the name. But if the mapping was not there, say I will remove this line, I remove that line, 
now if i ping i won't be able to ping it see it's showing unknown host that means the dns does not resolve so that is the use of your uh, etc host file that helps you uh, map ip addresses to names and you can ping those servers but this is applicable normally in the local scenario say you have a office where you have limited number of machines you can create a map of ip address to name and use this solution but if it is over the internet like all the websites and all then you have to use a public dns servers okay so that is about the dns concept okay thanks